When was I born? Yeah. I was born in December in 1925 in Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And the story goes that the nurse maid that my parents had hired, they dressed all in white with white over her head and they posed her in the, in the window of their apartment that looked out on the street holding the baby on Christmas Eve and everybody around came to stand and you know, watch and see. So that's the story of my birth. Welcome, good friends, to the singing school. So why do we sing? Because we have to, because birds do. It's built into us. It's a fundamental part of our anatomy. Why do we not sing is the terrible question now. Oh, my father was a wonderful person. Very outgoing, a salesman kind of person. Um, very warm-hearted, cordial man with a big greeting, always a, a big smile and arms out kind of thing. They both had, were very church people. They'd grown up in, in uh, churches and always sung, as, as people did. They sang much more, of course, communally and in families then, because people were, were, were just not used to having records and things like that. My father gave me wonderful advice I always thought should be at every conservatory. He said, if you want to be a composer, you go right ahead, do follow it as far as you can. But just remember, nobody owes you a living. The world does not owe you a living. You've got to find a way to support yourself while you're doing that. But I've done very different things. I think maybe the best piece I've ever done is called Songs for Eve. It was a commission from our local concert series, Chamber Music, down in the church in Charlemont. And they would like it to a local poet, so I started looking around and I had set some Archibald MacLeish before and he's a neighbor, and I had met him. Uh, so I started looking at, I, I wrote him and asked if he had a, a suggestion, and he said, you might find something in Songs for Eve. And I was just fascinated because there were a variety of traditional styles of poetry, traditional rhyme schemes and things, each one very different. And it's a retelling of the first chapter of Genesis, but his Eve, is the mother of us all. She's the truly liberated woman. Uh, Adam kind of stands by. It's very Christian, but she never mentions Christ. She doesn't even mention God particularly. He doesn't even mention God. And he'd really caught the whole gist of the women's movement, which had, was transpiring during the 60s. Rattle me, riddle me, riddle. And she says her fall was the fall from man to God. Not, not the fall from grace, but the fall to grace. And the devil speaks that the end of the world just is destroyed, but love lives on. So he's preaching a very good old message in very new dress. I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. I've been working on the railroad just to pass the time of way. My first visual, I don't think I've ever been asked that one before. Rise up so early in the morning. I can right now see my mother sitting at the piano and I'm sitting on the floor with my brother and I was maybe three and we were going through these cardboard things with the songs on them that my mother could play. Die, won't you blow, die, won't you blow, 
Dinah, won't you blow your horn? No, oh, there was someone in the kitchen with Dinah. Um, I certainly also remember up here, we had a pony. And I was trying to ride the pony and fell off. There was someone in the kitchen with Dinah. Someone I was my brother's helper. He was a year and a half, and we always thought just the same way. We had uh, we were very close, and uh, my parents gave him a sign with his name on it, as if he was running a store. It said Harrison Parker, big sign like this, and he loved that. And um, I think they looked at me and said, "Well, you need a sign too. What would you like your sign your sign to say?" And I said, "Eyes the helper that helps Harry." So that was what my sign was. <laughs> I was commissioned to write an opera, and there wasn't much uh, uh, for me to go on of what they wanted, but I thought I'd better find a story that I can set. And I remember going to the bookstore in the Upper West Side and looking through and finding this little tiny separate volume, which was a story, a long story, short story by Eudora Welty, who was, of course, extremely well known as a, as a writer. And, uh, but I thought, well, maybe I don't, I haven't ever seen this anywhere, so maybe it hasn't been set before. I didn't find out till later that it had been a play on Broadway. So it took me a year and um, so I finally got that done and I sent it down to her and she wrote back and said, of course I have to give you permission because there's not a word in here that isn't mine. I got a great big house standing empty. So, so then it took me another couple of years to write the, to write the opera. But it was a story about life in a small southern town in about 1930 with whites and blacks, and the, the moneyed part of town, the, the people that remain are Edna Earl, who tells the story. She's a woman in her 60s, and she's talking about her uncle, Daniel, who is younger than she is, the way some Southern families are. And he, Uncle Daniel is, a, is a, a natural. He's not mentally ill or anything. He just has never grown up, and he's very, polished looking, he's just fine and carries on a conversation, but he never learned about money and he never learned about women. And the story is the story of his disastrous collision with both. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, they're just, it's full of wonderful subtle humor. This is Alice's bread, oh, the bread I invented. And what, what, how is it different from any other bread? I, this was early 60s, Julia Child's book about French cooking came out. She had about 40 pages about how to make a loaf of French bread. And it was so complicated. And she said, you can't do it anyways in this country because the flour isn't right and the water isn't right and the yeast isn't right and the salt isn't right. So she has all these ways of compensating. And I thought, if that's all you need, that's what I'm going to do. So I put a quart of water and I put... 12 cups of flour and a couple of tablespoons of salt and, you know, what's missing? Just plain, the plain bread flour, unbleached. And that's what it is. It's just the simplest. And voila. Yeah, and voila. <laughs> so you can use it for anything. And it tastes delicious. It tastes different for each person that makes it. Uh, my daughter, uh, Liza, made this one. And hymns of glory sing. Yes, I've been teaching for years. I sometimes describe what I'm doing as, as somebody sitting on a three-legged stool, and I'm a composer and a conductor and a teacher. And I think the fact that I've been teaching since the very beginning has made me maybe too verbal about process in both of those other fields. What they learned in school about composition is is theoretical ideas, not the craft. And I find that I have to start everybody back at the beginning. I did this years ago in my teaching. I learned to do this, and I now it's exactly what I do, is start back at the very beginning with 
What happens when we open our mouths to sing? What are we really communicating? Are we communicating notes and rhythms? Well, yes, those are, those are the vehicle, but it's not the idea. Are we communicating words? Yes, but very often the words get swallowed up in the notes and the rhythms so that we're not thinking about what the words mean or how we're speaking them as we sing them. They get jammed into the notes. Um, and when people uh, perform, they are so concerned with getting it exactly right with what it is on the page, they don't stop to think that the page is a perversion itself of the sound because the page doesn't have any sound. There's no sound there. There's nothing that makes a sound in my ear. So that means that any sound that I'm going to draw off of this page, I bring to it. So every the way everybody looks at a page of music is different because we are all different. We all hear differently. So they have all of these notes to deal with. They want to write in four parts because soprano, alto, tenor, bass. It's as if that came down along with the Ten Commandments. There shall be sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses. It doesn't at all. It starts with one human throat. So I'm teaching song, I'm teaching melody, I'm teaching poetry because the way you read the words is the way you sing the song. And if you read the words in a dull fashion, you're going to be singing the song in a dull fashion. And that's so much of what we hear from schools is dull because they've learned the notes without the words and then they jam the words into the note. So you get, my country tis of the sweet land of... What are you singing about? You have no idea. You, you've been singing notes without it. I love that song as an example because the, the grammar is so complicated. Sweet, no, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. It's like a German sounds with the, with the verb at the very end. And we don't even think of it. So many of the Christmas carols have crazy mixed up uh, grammar. And if we start, start to sing them as if we understood what that grammar was and want to make the meaning clear, all of a sudden you get perfectly beautiful phrased singing. You don't get this mechanical no, 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 no. Uh, but the way conducting, for instance, is taught is to try to make a woman into a man. And a man's upper body is totally different from a woman's. And you get women trying to get all this strength in their arms and everything else, and they look ridiculous because it's not coming from inside. I take my inspiration for that from Martha Graham, who says it all begins, comes from here, which is also Chinese and martial arts, uh, and Qigong, which I still do. Today, I practice that. And conducting basically is a dance, and it's the dance of your own body. And if you try to dance somebody else's dance, you're going to look ridiculous. And so most of the women who were trying to be conductors were trying to conduct like men. If you look at it from the point of view of what's on the page, you're worried about sixteenth notes and quarter notes and whether whether you're doing it exactly right according to the page, but you totally miss that whole emotional thing that's underneath it. And I find it extremely difficult to do the music without the emotion. I think there is a certain amount of the practice of orchestral rehearsals and operatic rehearsals and stuff 
they kind of has to do that in order to get make sure that everybody's doing the right thing at the same time. But in my own work, I cannot, I cannot look at my own music and and perform what is on the page, because the page is a symbol to me of what is behind it, and I'm always going to do what's behind it. You guys, you guys sound terrific together. Well, thanks. We've had a lot of practice singing together. <laughs> You've been doing this for a while, right? Yes. We used to always sing at bedtime, and we would also sing in the car when we were driving from New York up to Massachusetts. It was a, like a four-hour trip when I was little. So towards the end, when we were all very tired of being in the car, um, the singing would start and we would get into songs, all, all the folk songs and rounds. I learned how to sing rounds, I think, driving in the car. <laughs> Do you think that you're the closest to your mother when you sing with her? But I think you could say that. It's a, it's, it's a very special thing to sing together. I think singing with anybody um, brings you closer. The day that Martin Luther King was killed, I was at home in my apartment in New York, surrounded by children and all the, the daily life things. And it was just, just horrifying. And the next thing that happened was a phone call saying, we want a piece, we want to sing a piece one year from today. We want you to, to write it. So I started right away. It was wonderful for me because it gave me a place to focus right away. So I got out, I had several um, collections of, of Dr. King's writings but I got everything that I could put my hands on, and I read, and I read, and I read for four months, five months, six months. I couldn't find a single phrase that I wanted to set out of all of the things that he had written and the things that he had said. He's two different things. He's the white part of me and the, and the black part of him that seemed to be that, that collide and, and need each other. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop, I won't mind. Like anybody, I would like to have a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to that promised land. said, I, I've been to the mountaintop. I just want to do God's will. I want you to know that we as a people will get to the promised land. So the, the verse from the Bible that I chose for the baritone solo after that is, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will tell us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. And he will tell us of his ways. I 
found this wonderful spiritual in a book that I had used all the time, one of my basic ones, but you don't see things until you're looking for them. You know, you can turn the pages over and over and never you notice a small one that's down in the corner. And I found this one. It starts, way up on the mountain. And the response from the chorus is, Lord, mountain top, Lord. I heard God talking, Lord, chilling, a talk of home, Lord. The perfect response to that, I mountain top, I heard that. So I knew my friend Seth McCoy, black tenor, had been a post office delivery person in Cleveland when somebody found him and got him out with his gorgeous tenor voice. And I start with a forte high A for tenor usually what you have to work up for. I thought he was the only one in the world could do it. it finds that, I find that all tenors love a song that starts with a forte high A. But anyway, so he does it. So you've had this very slow, uh, low contemplative piece about people walking in the way of the Lord, the scale steps going up and down. And then out of it, out of nowhere comes this tenor voice. <laughs> I decided early on, I can only write for a perceived need. I cannot write a piece for somebody's concert. I don't see any need for a concert. For a school, there's a need. For a church, there's a need. For a community group, there's a need. I want to know that my piece is going to be performed at a place where it is needed and appreciated, that it's not just sitting out in the ether somewhere. All of box music, all of, most of the music that was the people we love is was written for need. That was what they lived on, and they didn't. But they weren't paid by the composition. They were paid for producing the concert that the music was at, so that they were not just composing in an ivory corner. They were rehearsing and and uh, collecting people together to to rehearse to be the choir or the orchestra, and working with it. And it all got so abstract by the end of the of the nineteenth century where the composer, as a separate being, came into being. Sure, there's a muse, but it's there for finding. It's a muse that dwells very much in craft. It, it doesn't just uh, come to you and you write. There are a whole lot of people who write music as if it did. But the more, but your, the craft as a, a person who makes a perfectly beautiful table because they choose good wood and they handle it with care and and know how to how to uh, sand it and cut it and finish it, put it together. I felt as always as if I was at my best when I was with Tommy. He was always courteous and calm and kind and fun to be with, um, and I didn't recognize for a long time how much I really liked being with him, and it was that gradual realization, not a falling in love at the moment, but a, a gradual realization that this is who I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. I got the key to the kingdom, I got the key, oh yes, I have the number. We both came to New York in the same year, uh, but very separately, to work with Robert Shaw. I was going to be his student at Juilliard, and Tom was a baritone, a wonderful voice, and was accepted right away into the inner circle of uh, singers who did all of the things that worked with Shaw. They had the first integrated choirs that sang in the South and traveled in the South, and they would not stay in a hotel unless the black singers could stay there as well. They were really groundbreaking in a lot of ways. It was lovely. We only had 21 years, but they were packed full of activity and drama and 
five wonderful children, and uh, I learned so much from him. I was in high school, I was a junior in high school in December 41. And uh, we were listening to the Boston Symphony on the radio at home, and then the announcement came in the middle of that we program. We this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. And then right away, some of the boys from my high school, the senior boys, left. And within a year, one of them had been killed. And then everything changed around the the town, though I don't have a clear memory really of what it was like before, but I remember very clearly all of the, the, the rationing and the um, gasoline rationing, so we, we didn't go for drives in the car anymore, and the um, food rationings. We had in the middle of the family table a sugar bowl that held two pounds of sugar, and that had been in my father's family in World War I, and that was then and that now in World War II, two pounds was your ration for, I forget how long, a week or two weeks, something like that. And that was all the sugar. So when you took a spoon for a half a cup out of that, you realized that what was left had to last you for the rest of that time. I've always loved Emily Dickinson. And it's become an obsession as I've gotten older. I would much rather set her poems than almost anybody else's because so much is suggested there. So I began to feel this deepening kinship with her. Not that she was retreating from the world. She was very much part of it. She loved her time at college, and she came home because her father insisted that she come home. Um, and then she stayed at home, but she protected her own time and her own work. Her father always made fun of her poetry. My father didn't make fun of my music. He was always very, very um, accepting of it, but he didn't understand it. Emily's and my situations were very similar in some ways and very different in others. But certainly we're shaped by this climate. We're shaped by this very rugged countryside, the granite and the hills. We're shaped by something in the New England soul that seems to be concerned with, with big, big questions. Life and death and love and suffering, joy and sorrow, boy, are they mixed. I think it's because they're two sides of the same coin. One defines the other. And she knows this so well, and it's exactly what I'm playing with in my music. So that when I'm memorizing one of her poems and working with it over a period of weeks or months, I begin to, to see more and more clearly, to relate myself more and more clearly to the shape of that poem. I want to feel as if I know it so well that I'm starting at the same point that Emily started at. Of course, impossible. Are you still optimistic after all this year? Oh, there's no way I can be anything else. Every new baby that's born is a new possibility, and they have it new in front of them. I don't think there really is such a thing as progress, or at least we've never found moral progress. 
we found progress in all kinds of material things, but not with things that matter. All over the world, most people are just striving to find a place to sleep that night or enough to feed their families, trying to stay together. And our inhumanity towards other human beings is just incredible. And our selfishness in this society because we have too much. So it's, I'm, I'm afraid there has to be a real reckoning coming, a real revolution or something like that. And I'm just incredibly fortunate to be living at a time where here I am. I've been retired for over 20 years. Or I don't retire because I'm self-employed, but I've been living up here where I would rather be than anywhere else in the world and able to do what I absolutely love and still able to, still people want to come to me to, to work. And I just feel so fortunate. And I still can write, not as much as I had been doing, but still. And I've, I've just have had a most fortunate life. Oh, my.